you who were here earlier today is Juan's birthday. All right. How many times? So today I'm going to talk about casting resins, and uh, one of the things that uh, got started in casting resins was because I was working with mesquite. And if you ever work with mesquite, uh, most of the time it's pretty rotten or punky wood or it's wormhole eaten or uh, set this one aside for a second or even on your big pieces if you're doing flat work has cracks not not even just the pith but cracks down it it's it's, it's, a, it's a real pretty wood to work with and a lot of people like it but what do you do with it? You can't, if you, if you take this, you can only get like a two inch piece here and then you, you either left with gluing it up or uh, cutting it up and putting it in your firewood. And a lot of times we used, we've used our uh, mesquite wood for firewood and smoking for a long, long time. But uh, there's a mesquite association that, uh, there's a group of people that do mesquite work that my dad's been a part of for a little over 20 years. And they do artwork pieces, they do furniture pieces, they do bowls and turned iron, the, the whole gamut of things with wood. They have what, like two meetings a year? One down in... One at Fredericksburg. One at they used to have one at San Angelo, but they don't have it anymore. Oh, they don't have that one no, anymore? No, they shut that one down. I went I went to that one. That was very interesting. It is very, not, very nice work. Very good craftsmanship. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful stuff. So they don't... Only, only Fredericksburg? Now? Only Fredericksburg that I know of. Oh. Wow. And that's coming up to the second weekend October. Uh -huh. And... It's worth going to. It, it is worth going to. It's down on the, the main square at... Fredericksburg, and then you can go and see that, and then walk down the the main streets. There's some stuff down in there. Uh, it is a very uh, touristy town. But uh, so, anyways, we started working with the flat work and trying to do some different things. And uh, my dad does furniture work. He starts to do bigger things and do. He bought a bandsaw sawmill in the early 2000s so he could cut up the uh, the logs and started making furniture out well we started using cherry tree toys resin epoxy resin to fill the cracks and it just bleed it in here and then you can work with it do something with it and that's that's kind of what uh, got me started into doing casting it's not really casting per se but it was it was kind of a start of that, and then now it's it's kind of been named casting, and, and they do casting with resin for jewelry and other pieces, even the, the pieces that Jim Bob uh, brought back from SWAT, the amalgamat blanks and the the flower girl blanks. Now the flower girl blanks, I saw those and I was kind of curious about. It. She did have some turned items there that were sitting there on her table, and. Uh, how, how do you how do you cast these flowers and maintain the flowers when you turn them out? Because because you're going to remove some of that material when you do that. So uh, it's very interesting to see how she was able to take those and maintain the flowers and keep the the flowers in those in those castings. So there's a difference between stabilization and one of the things that we we as a club bought is a stabilization chamber, is it 10 inches or 12 inches? 10. 10 inch, so it's, it's 10 inch diameter and it's two foot tall. And we're gonna get that up and going so that we can stabilize blanks. And I brought some stabilized pieces. So the stabilize is gonna take your punky wood and the stabilization chamber, you submerse your pieces down in it and then you're you pulling a vacuum, so you're pulling out all the air out of your piece. Now, if you notice, this one's got big holes in it. So, the stabilization goes down into the punky part of the wood, but it doesn't fill the holes. And 
this one's the same way. It's not. It's not quite as bad. That, at least that TV's going. So the, these have been stabilized. They hadn't been cast. So what I'm going to do with these is I'm going to talk about filling these voids. And you, in, in most cases, most people think epoxies. Uh, what we want to use for casting is urethane resins, <coughs> resins that are more, more suitable for long-term use, I guess. The, I do have epoxy resins here that I use as liquid diamonds. It's epoxy. Uh, the Amazing Clear Cast is epoxy, and the, the Lumalite Clear Slow is a urethane. The, I have been told that the liquid diamonds, the uh, JB Royal is another one that, that people use. When you cast with those, since they are epoxy, they will turn yellow. And, and so what, what you want to use is a urethane mm -hmm. resin that will not turn yellow. And the epoxy will get extremely hard. Uh, I've, got a, I've got a sheet here, and I'm going to pass this around. and I'll just pass it around. It kind of says some of the... This chart I got off of Don Ward. And so on the, on the front side is a chart that talks about resins. And on the back side is some of the steps that I'm going to talk about. Um, and I'll just turn that around and get started. So there's four main types of cast that we're going to, that we're concerned about as wood turners. And uh, I've got several items here that I can cast. Uh, so... The first one is surface coating. If I wanted to take this piece here and make a countertop out of it or something like that, I'd use a surface coat. It's going to be a thin coat, like a 16th or an 8th inch coat. And I'm going to want to find the type of resin that would do that. And each, each resin is more suitable for a different type of casting. And so the first one is, is surface coating. The second one is UV resin. I didn't know anything about UV resin, but I knew that Mark Middleton had talked about it. He had talked about it before, and I used I it just, a lot. I had just barely thought about it, and I didn't know anything. Well, I went to SWAT and went to uh, Barry Gross, and he talked about it. Well, he was standing at his lathe, and he did at least two pin tubes on the lathe during the demonstration, which was hour, hour and a half long. And one of them was a label cast, the other one was a circuit board pin. And he, he just run a bead, hit it with UV resin. Run a bead, you hit it with UV resin. Or hit it with the UV light. And it would, it would cure itself. And he said, now, if I was going to do this and it was going to be something that was a little thicker than that, I would take it out in the sun for five, ten minutes. And it was... So while we're talking about the UV resin, I've got this pin that's been setting aside for this Sierra tube that's been sitting, it's a mesquite burl. And it's got a couple of voids in it. And I haven't done anything with it because I hadn't had time to do anything with it. But, so if I take a little bit of turquoise here, and this UV resin, I'm going to put a drop in. right there in the void and I'm going to take a little bit of this turquoise in here and kind of get it down in that that void right there so how many times do we do things like this where we start something and then Oh, man, I gotta either wait for this to dry or I can hit this with this UV light and it's like hitting an accelerator on CA glue. And that's what Barry Gross was doing in his demo. He would run a bead on his pin tube and then he'd hit it with this light and he'd run another bead. And he made layers around. I want you to take these for a minute. These are both 
UV resin you might want to show later on. So he's got some rings here that he's is embedded. One of them is abalone. Another one is watch parts. Yes, sir. Is that right? So these these rings have abalone, which is seashells, and then watch parts, which are uh, popular cast pieces. But this this piece this this is this is dry. Why don't you pass that around? And it's it's ready to go. And Bryce, ready. Can I interrupt for just a second? Take your pit. If anybody wants any abalone to do that kind of stuff with, I bought a bag at SWAT a few years ago. It's dirt cheap. Uh, come out. It's just little scrappy pieces, cutoffs. But they were selling their waste. And I've got it. If you want to try that. I've, I've, also, got I've also got abalone. I've seen it. If somebody wants some. So, The problem with casting resin for me has always been if you got to a place where you need it, like I'm going to show this right quick and I'll pass it around in a minute. But this, this piece right here, so let me turn it over, is, a, is some cotton that I stuffed down in one of my molds. And up here you can see that the resin didn't adhere to the or it didn't get resin down enough into the cotton to make the blank stick so now it's it's split off well what do you do with that and you either recast it or which takes at least a day to get into or you uh chunk it in the trash and i don't want to chunk it in the trash because a lot of times you got something like a burl or piece a really nice piece of wood even though you're talking about a a pin blank that's two and a half inches long or a five inch for a full long one, you've got something that you've that's really pretty with the with the void in it or something and you want to do something, you don't want to throw that in the garbage or uh, you want to save your pin tube, you're going to have to turn it all the way off. So this, this is cotton and what happened was, so I had been mixing up this liquid diamonds two to one by volume and according to Don Ward, it's two to one by weight. And it's a little bit thicker when you do it two to one by weight. And it doesn't bleed all the way down into the, into the cotton as it, as it did. So I, I cast two pieces for Jim Bob in, of cypress. Was this last year's swat or two years ago? Well, that's not cypress. That's cedar. Cedar. And so it had a bunch of void in it. And I cast this, I think Larry Morgan turned the other piece. Yeah, he said it was harder than a brick. It's harder than a brick. And <laughs> that's why I hadn't done anything with it. But, uh, so this, this is a cast that I've done, and I didn't do a pressure, pressure pot, because obviously it's not going to fit. But what I use is, is masking tape on the back. But when I was mixing up the liquid diamonds, as you can see, the tape didn't hold it. And I was doing it in my house, and it got all over my wife's new floor, and that was not a good thing. I was scrubbing it. So, uh, so that's what I had anticipated with this cotton blank, and so I had anticipated it going down in there, but apparently it's got a little thicker viscosity whenever it's mixed up correctly by weight, and uh, it didn't soak down in as good. So I'm going to pass this around. It's got a piece here that's been the, where I cut it off to make it the size and then I went ahead and glued this in so that you're going to see what the turn piece down to and then where it split off of there so uh Bryce did you put that in the pressure pot after you cast it? I did I and did soak into it? it still didn't soak in there there was like a down at the bottom an eighth to a quarter inch of a cotton that I could just peel off <laughs> that uh, in, in there, and you would have thought that cot, you know, cotton's fibrous is make filters and stuff out of, and I'd packed it in there. Was but that a, a fast cure resin, or uh, it was liquid diamonds? And my experience was it bled through tape, so I thought it would bleed yeah. through the cotton. And uh, the 
what I will do next time, there is a amazing cure, ama amazing, it's Hobby Lobby, yeah. and it's uh, amazing, the, clear cast. amazing clear cast, yeah. that's it, and it's uh, deep Real. pour, the deep Real pour is supposed to be like water, and it will fill down in there, the and getting back to my thing, I'll talk about that in a minute, but the deep pour is up to two inches. What was the name again, Amazing? Amazing clear cast. That's it's an Alumalite. It's Alumalite brand, but uh, the, uh, so the Amazing clear cast, they don't say it's required to use a pressure pot, but for yeah. every time you're gonna cast, if you can put it in a pressure pot, you're better off. It will take your bubbles out, it will help get down into your voids better. Big warning, use lots of ventilation on that stuff. It stinks bad. Yes, yes. It, and and most of the time when you're mixing this up, you're gonna to wanna to use a, a respirator. I found that out, I, was, you know, I had a big shop and I had garage doors open in the, in the winter time and I was using uh, ProMarine. I had been given a two gallon kit of it and the ProMarine is mixed up one to one. So. If, if y'all know me, I'm, I'm opportunistic, and I, I use stuff as, as I find it. Well, I was doing a cast for a friend of mine. He wanted a, uh, he was casting a table with wine stoppers that he'd cut in half and, and beer bottles and caps and stuff that he'd, his wife had put around, and they wanted to cast that. And so we're just doing a clear cast, but it's going to stay outside all the time. And I told him, well, you've got to find a casting resin that has a uh, UV inhibitor in it. And so we found this ProMarine, and it was, uh, I think, $110 for two gallons on Amazon. And he used two and a quarter kits, well, or three and a quarter kits, and I wound up with the three quarters of a kit whenever, I, whenever he finished with that. And so that's what I was using. Well, I didn't know it, but it was it was some stout stuff. And uh, what I, with all of the stuff and the fan blowing through my shop throughout the winter time, what I was, what I figured out was, on Thursday I would pour on a piece piece like this flat. Well, the next day I had a migraine headache. It was triggering these migraine headaches, and I I, I was winding up sick the day after I poured resin. So then I started using my respirator on it, even though that I was in the big shop and well ventilated, that uh, it was still getting to me. And so uh, the, other, the other night when I cast the bottle stopper for this demonstration that I practiced on, I was using my respirator. And I, I was using that <coughs> even whenever we cast, um, we cast this bowl for Andy. So, the other is quick curing, that'd be the third, and it's for art, for photo encapsulation, uh, small castings, um, the UV, he did it during the demo, which is, a, which is, can be a quick casting, and then the deep pour, which is more for river tables, for large castings, for things where you're going to be pouring thick, and the deep pour, uh, the deep pour, the amazing clear cast deep pour at Hobby Lobby that you can get here local, it'll go up to uh, two inches. Now the the stuff there, uh, the loom, this information I got from video. There's tons of videos online about casting, and there's Facebook groups out there, pin casting, resin casting, uh, pin blank casting. This was, this was from the Lumalite, and he was talking about the Lumalite clear, clear cast deep pour, and he was talking about the viscosity of that, which is on that sheet that I passed around. The viscosity, when you mix it up, is almost like water. So, like my cotton blank, if, if I had known about that before I'd cast it, I probably would have done that. Now, my experience has been that my tape couldn't hold that, so that's what my thoughts were. Uh, it didn't work out that way. Uh, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to go through our casting steps or what I try to do and anybody that 
wants to cast some stuff or anybody that needs some help casting with stuff or that you know there there's lots of dollars up here on this table and uh, if you don't have the equipment or you just want a small thing and you like like Andy his piece right here if you just want a small piece done I'm more than happy to help you do that and, and get that get that going for you the first thing that you need to take in consideration is your mold and um, so I've got this this is a silicon mold that I can order online I think um, I think I got either Turner's house or Turner's warehouse or P-Town Subby one of the two of these he makes these uh, Sierra blank molds that are silicon. They got plugs that go in. That you can actually set your tube in, and they're for label casting. So that you put your label on the tube, stick it in here, put your plugs in, and then pour cast, clear cast on it. He also makes one for uh, flame lines. Uh, no, that that type of mold right there. The, he makes well, that in a slim line also. He, he makes, the, I'm, I'm going to pass these around here in a minute. I mean, we can start, we can start with that. <clears throat> but it's just a silicon pour. It, it's a, somebody has made that out of this silicon mold. And you, this is a kit that you can get out of Hobby Lobby. It's a small kit. And uh, I, had, I had toyed with the idea of making this into my bottle stopper blank before I talked to Michael. Yeah. And he said, hey, I can make you one of those. And so I did that. A few years ago, I was going to make some Sierras, and I was thinking about trying to get into label casting. And so I had made a kit like this, where it's a three-quarter inch or one inch HDPE, and I've drilled a hole in it. I will put a cap on the bottom, set the tube in, and cast it. But I haven't ever even used these. I mean, I probably used that one once. It looks like it's got some resin on the top. For us that are ignorant, what is label casting? Label casting is where you take a, a pin tube, right. just a, a brass pin tube, and you've got it. a label on it, and roll it on there and stick it on there. Okay. And so, like Don Borge with his rattlesnake blanks, that's that's essentially a label cast. Uh, the label cast that more more like label class is something that's been printed onto like a picture. Or a saying, or uh, I and did one. And then the cap, or the resin is on top of that. And the resin is on top of that, and it's clear. Got and so the clear stuff is what you're going to want the, the urethane resin. It's going to be. Uh, I have made these out of HDPE. This is for a full pin tube. Where do you get that material? This, this is a, a piece of. Yeah. Cutting board that I've cut up from Hob, uh, <laughs> Sam's. Yeah, I was going to say. But this is what Michael is making and it's selling what? back here. And he's got a sign up list that you just, you know, put your name, what you want, he'll make it for you. This is what he made. And so here, here's a piece that's a, a five by six that I've got laid out. Now, I hadn't, these pieces aren't glued down. This is box elder. But this, this is a lot what you're going to see, like, like what uh, Eugene Soto makes with his uh, casted blanks. And so you got, you're going to have two, two pieces here, and you're going to have a resin river between it, and then you're going to saw these blanks in. Okay. So that's what this is right here. And this is how he would do this. Now what I would do, if I'm getting ready to cast this, is I was going to... I, I'm going to make sure that my blank, my mold is clean, and I'm going to hit it with this mold release, just to spritz it, and then I'm going to glue down my, use some hot glue and glue down this. Otherwise, you're going to have to clamp it down. Your your wood is lighter than the resin; it will float. And so the, these pieces are loose, but that's, that's how you would make a block mold for several pins. That would make six pins there. If with you six heat six. your mold up ahead of time, have you ever poured one where the corners pull in? No. If it's cold, the corners will pull in. And you're going, how in the world did that? 
but it's because I always heat my mold. I, I have not. I have not done that, and I hadn't had that problem. Well, in the winter more. time, <laughs> well, watch out. Yeah, I've heard that recommended a lot I, I, of times. So, the mold. well, that's oh. a chemical reaction. Yeah. So oh, here, here right. is here's what he's talking about. Here's here's a cup. Uh, the blank that I sent around with the cotton a while ago, this is the leftover resin that was liquid diamonds with green dye in it. And I left it in the cup and I come back the next day and it melted the cup. Ah. And, uh, so there's a reaction that happens when you hit the part A and the part B together. You mix those together and there's a reaction happens. Well, when reaction happens in chemistry, it, it produces heat and releases that heat. And MEKT is the I believe is the the reactant that you put in the part A resin to, to make it go harder. Uh, it's it's an acetate. If you need more information, I can send you the information from Don Ward. He sent me. I talked to him at SWAT and I told him that I was fixing to get ready to do this demo on on uh, casting. And he said, Oh, well I've got all of these. Well I've come to find out he's got two books online too that you can buy from. Amazon, but he, he had a four-part series, an introduction in a four-part series on casting, and then the sheet that I passed around with the chart that had the different resins on it that uh, I've laminated. I'm going to keep it in my shop. I'm going to put it right there with my stuff to cast so that I can do that. And then, uh, so you talk, you the resins that you see a lot of a lot of people cast with uh, liquid diamonds is easy to get. Well, they're all they're all easy to get. Uh, liquid diamonds, uh, I believe, it was it? Speakeasy. We're talking <coughs> Speakeasy turned one of the two of them. They they use a lot of liquid diamonds. But he's using JB Royal now. JB Royal is the same thing as Royal Palm. Okay. And so when I'm buying a resin, I'm looking at something that was easy. When I talked to my friend and he wanted to do his table, I said, "Look, something easy. It's mixed together easy. Mix one to one." Uh, I use Solo cups to mix up with one to one. But if you get something that mixes up other than one to one ratio, you got to have measurements. So I've got. In, in my, I've, I've got these that have measurement increments on them. And then these come in the kits or Hobby Lobby that have small measurement increments on them. And then uh, when I was at Woodcraft in <coughs> Fort Worth, I come up with these that are small paint type cups that have the measurement increments on them. But uh, then you, you got to clean them or throw them away and get new ones. So, uh, the liquid diamonds mixes up two to one by weight, and I had been mixing it up by volume. And I got a hard, this is hard as a brick. It's, it, it cured, but it's probably not exactly right. The other day when I did, the, did it by weight with the weight scale, I've gotten a, di a digital weight scale that uh, I can put a cup on, and I'm going to tear it, zero it, and then mix the two parts according to the mixture. So this is one to one by volume for the amazing clear cast. The Lumalite, the reason I had never bought any Lumalite clear slow was because I didn't have a scale. And so I, my aunt sent me home with a, uh, a casting pot, a scale, and some uh, mica powders. I'll talk about the mica powders in a minute. But uh, with the scale, now I can use the Alumalite Clear Slow. And so the Alumalite Clear Slow is by weight. Uh, Alumalite Clear has got about a seven minute work time before it starts to make jelly. The uh, Clear Slow gives you a little bit more time. It's a 12 minute. And the, if you look at that chart, one of the things that's on there is the hardness. The average on there is about 80. So 75 is the low shore D, and then 80 is the, the high. And one of the things that whenever I 
got stuff like this that I would cut up from my dad that was dropped from his saw, whatever he was making, and I'd bring it back and I'd share it with Jim Bob or uh, try to turn it even myself. Was you know it had been sitting there a long time and it's fully cured resin, and the fully cured resin is extremely hard on our turning tools, and uh, I had gotten a, a friend that had made a label cast for me for a friend of mine and he had sent it to me and I turned it, it was out of liquid dimes. I said, oh, what kind of resin did you use? Because that, I've been casting stuff and I, it was, it's always hard as rock. And the, the liquid diamonds was not. And then the, the lumilide is supposed to not be as well. But, I mean, if you're talking about 80 Shore D, what I found on that is you got about a week to two week window before it is fully cured. And, and this, this here, Don Moore's given the, the full, uh, full cure timeline on here. Where is it? Well, I, I saw it on there, but I can't find it right now. But you got, you got about three to seven days before it's fully cured. And if you can get it by the time that it's time to, the demold time, is about 24 hours, 12 to 24 hours, 12, 24 to 48 hours on most of these. Um, clear slow, 24 to 72 hours. So if you get it in that window and you pull it out and you demold it, it's, it's not fully cured red. It's, it's, it's going to be solid, but it's not fully cured. And it, you can turn it in that time and it's soft. It's not as treacherous on your tool. Now one of the things that you have to keep in mind when you start casting, this blank right here, I cast it this week. And so I have, this is what I cast, Illumilite Amazing Clear Cast. And if you notice, out here on this, it's, it's a good solid color. But down here, when it gets down to pin tube thickness, you can see the pin tube in here. So. Typically, if I'd have known that, I would have put uh, paint in my tube, and so it wouldn't come out gold like it is with the. So it's it's kind of a green and gold. But I haven't had that much trouble when I've done that with uh, the mica powders, and this was done with mica powders. The mica powders are usually a full opaque, opaque that I don't do that. Now, what I did notice when I was turning or when I was pouring this piece for uh, Andy Carr was we were getting some, the black that was a, we were using, I was using the black, but it was coming out translucent. But if you want to make it richer, you just add more powder. And so, get moving on to that, I've got two different kinds of powder that I use. I've got mica powder that's um, casting choice, caster's choice. It comes from Turner's Warehouse, I think um, Turntex, carries it. He also carries P-Town Subby. Uh, Speakeasy carries the, the, the P-Town Subby. But it's, it's mica powders or Pearlex. One of our... Uh, Hobby Lobby. Well, Hobby Lobby carries Pearlex and so does Varsity Bookstore, which is one of our corporate sponsors. They, they have the full line of Pearlex. Uh, Alan Trout... <coughs> the, he's the guy that does out of San Antonio that does artwork with Ben. Sorry. So Alan Trout, a few years ago, I was at SWAT and he was doing these castings that he was doing vases that are about five, six inches deep, and he was casting them out of out of either a burl or he did one of the pieces that he had in gallery. He had done it with acorn shells and those acorn shells he'd cast them and what he typically uses is a predominant color and a lesser color and he would pour the one in he'd take his mixture and he would pour the one one cup in which is the predominant color and then he would drop the other color in and, and what it would do is make a swirl of those two colors and your predominant color would be your ma your master color and then the secondary color and so that's what I was trying to do. I thought it was real cool. And one of the things that he did was he was taking these burl pieces, 
that are, uh, and he, he liked to do it on a 40-60 ratio, percent ratio, where it's 40% wood, 60% resin. And he would, he would build up these cups or molds, and going back to molds, you can use just about anything. In fact, Andy brought me a whole bunch of tubs, not quite that big, but butter dishes and things that they cleaned up and used, and you can put those as a tub, set your piece in it, now you're going to have to hold it down in there to keep it from floating out, but we put put that, and that's what we did on this. We had a had a tub that all the way to the top. Now, one of the things that he was saying that he saw on a video, and I had never used it before, was uh, rice. So we put some rice down in the bottom of that, put a plastic butt bag around this, and then filled the plastic bag with the resin. Put this down in the in the in the rice, and you didn't have to fill the whole container up with resin to fill up these voids. It saved a lot of resin. Didn't saved it? a lot of resin. I, if you look at my stuff, this is the leftover from what I've used this week. I don't measure it real accurately. I try to get it so that, uh, I guess, and I I I've turned out pretty lucky now. If, and, and I know with what I'm working with, like this has a 30 minute work time, the liquid diamonds, um, this one, amazing clear cast, 30 to 40 minute work time. This, this one's the only one, or your five minute epoxies, and usually with the five minute epoxy, I'm trying to glue stuff together or just get it on there so I can get it done quickly. And, uh, but the, the amazing clear cast, or the clear, the, this is Illumina Clear, Illumilite Clear Slow. So I was specifically doing something specific with it. And I did one color, put it in there, and I'll, that's what I was doing my bottle stopper with. And uh, so I'm going to use, I've used the turquoise. I've got some coral here. Now the coral you have to be real careful like the diatomaceous earth when we're mixing up our polishing paste. The coral, the sea stuff, it will get in your lungs and it will cause problems. So wear, get, wear a mask <coughs> at least to keep the dust off of you. But the, the coral is, is a red color. I, I tend to use colors that I like, to, colors that are appealing to me. And uh, that, that's one. You know, that's why this one is red and black. And, you know, it's left over from the black that we used on Andy's piece, so I mixed a little red in there, and, and I'm a Texas Tech fan, so there you go. Also like green, so that's the green with the uh, the honeycomb, and I, I said I'd pass these around and let you look around them. That honeycomb, they told me you have to clean, because I bought a bunch of it, you got to clean it with lacquer thinner and really right. make sure it so maybe well that's what this, they did they, this, maybe they didn't clean it as good as they needed to well it's bought blank so i know but so it should it should have been <laughs> so i would mix up a cup of the resin whatever resin i'm going to use for the pour that i'm going to use and i've got it you know like i said i'm i'm high tech i use solo cups uh, when I came home from my aunt, she gave me all of her casts and stuff. She had a stack of those pre-measured cups that I was like, ooh, where where you get that from? Uh, when you mix up the resin, <coughs> and if it's still a little bit too thick for what you need, can you thin it with acetone mm -hmm. or anything? No. No. There, there's stuck. no added. It's, it's, it's like that. Now, now what uh, you can do to make it thinner is put it on heat either on a, a hot water or on a hot plate or something that's going to heat it up a little bit. But and usually your part A is a little a little thicker. And so I was doing that this winter and I had a cup of it and I poured the A and I knew it was real thick and it was cold. And so I was trying to heat it up. I set it over on my stove and by the time I turned around it melted the cup and it was all over everything. <laughs> well, it, Great. You know, I was... I was having problems with that stuff getting to getting to my sinuses, <laughs> so now the whole room smells like that, and it's just burning off the top of my stove. And uh, the 
you know, in the winter time we don't like to open up or stop as much, but I had to open it up. And uh, there's a there's a reaction time on here. Um, so you're going to mix up your epoxy, you're going to add your additive. You, if you're going to use turquoise or the rock or something, you're probably going to add that into the clear onto your piece like I did with that one piece. If you add the, the mica powders, you're going to measure out enough and here's my measuring stick. It's when I stick that into the, the mica powder, I'm going to just grab a piece of it. It's going to be humped up on the, a heaping, a heaping popsicle stick. And I dump it in the resin and then mix it in. I got and a question. If, if, you, if you make a mistake in your calculation of how much resin you got to have to finish your job, and you lack this much at the top, and you've gone in and you've dumped in three teaspoons of microfound. Now you like that much. You've you already done this much. Now you like that much. Now the micro powder you put in the second one to, to mix it up to finish up your job. How in the devil do you determine how much micro powder do you put in that because your, your, your ratios are different. So this piece right here, it was poured several days, and I would mix up resin, and I'd pour it in there. And what you can see, I use I use the same color every time. It may or may not be the same. Yeah, the mixture. Razor layer is going to be different. The, <laughs> different but, color. Yeah, but they fine. eat into each other. They eat into each other. The and, reaction does. And, and it doesn't. It's not going to. Because it's because the mica powder is, if it's the translucent, it matters because you're going to get a richer color or you're going to get a, a lighter color depending on the amount of uh, the droplets that you put in there. If you're using the mica powder, this is stuff. This is actual grains that's suspended into the resin. It doesn't mix with the resin. It's suspended into the resin. So th this is holding that grain, that real fine grain of uh, powder. But this this was poured over a period of a week. And I, I would come in and I'd pour it. And Jim Bob was asking about it, and he would say, what are you, well, it's still absorbing. The, and it goes down and runs into the, all the cracks and runs all in there. And, you know, that's, this, you know, doing stuff like this is usually a multi-day process. And whether it's whether it's clear or uh, other. Now, if I am going to try to do something, the uh, like this week, had I poured in, I was just guessing. And where's your bottle stop? Well, I'll just pull it out. So when I poured this. I poured this and it was about a sixteenth or eighth of an inch deeper than my wood on here and it went down into found voids and soaked in, probably leaked out a little bit in here, but uh, it was over that. Now if it hadn't have been over that, Harry, what I would have done real quick is mix up another batch real quick. That's my and question. Then do you're going to have two layers of different colors? Well, it, it, rather, if if I'm doing it to fill this, no, because I'm going to mix it, and I I would probably use a popsicle stick or something and swirl it together. But well, then the second question I have: How long do you have from the time that you mix your resin until you have to get it to the pot to get there? It, that's that's your your working time. So with the Lumalite Clear Slow, the Lumalite Clear, you got the Lumalite Clear seven minutes. The uh, Clear Slow is twelve minutes. With with this is thirty minutes. With so the amazing, working time. It's the working so time. If you working time, if it if it starts to gel, away. that's what uh, that's it will. Start I've to had gel. it so yeah. bad, even with that slow, that I stirred it up and I was gonna Rhonda wanted coffee beans and white resin and I mixed up that white resin and I was used to using the Illumilite Slow 
but this white she bought, bought was Fast. It wasn't the slow case, uh, the cast. The, uh, it was the blue light slow. Anyway, I got ready to pour it into the mold, and it went that far and quit, and it looked like Mick Jagger's tongue hanging out. It, 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 it just, I had to drop it. It got so hot in my hand. So I learned that that's what happens when you exceed yeah. your time. You learned that the hard way. Yep, that, so did you say that? Well, one of the other things Somebody that you it. see on these casting demonstrations here is they do uh, they do flip cups well they'll mix it up and they got their thermometer that they put it on the cup and it, at at this temperature right before it gets hard they're gonna dump it so they watch they that, that temperature real carefully this, this this would tell the temperature of what that yeah that makes it swirl makes it to make it to make swirl the, the, everything Becoming one color, like what what hard. Eugene Jim Soto Ball. did that Jim Ball brought. Let me see here, eleven forty. So what I do is I cast it, and I would set it into into my casting pot, and uh, I there's a disc in here in the bottom because I know it leaks, so I put a disc down in the bottom. You put it in here, you seal it. Like this, and then uh, the Harbor Freight. This this is a Harbor Freight paint pots, and what what most people do is they uh, they say that they leak, and may, I don't know if it's the just the quality of it or the quality of your O ring in here, but uh, they say it leaks, and I've I've experienced that. So you put your air on here. If you valve it off. You need to hold the 50 pounds of pressure, 40 to 45 to 55 pounds of pressure on there during the time that your resin is curing in order for it to do what it's supposed to do in the pressure pot to release the bubbles. So when you when it leaks like that, what do you do? Well, let me let me interrupt you just a minute because you say yours leaks. Mine leaked at first, okay? And I kept moving the lid around until I found a place that didn't leak. And I marked it. Yeah. Well, see, this one's got the marks on it. So. Yeah. And they're numbered, just like that. Yeah. And then I did a test. Each time I did that, I uh, put pressure in it and waited 48 hours to see if it dropped. And I finally made it to where it would stay 48 hours at the pressure I put in it. I see. Then you then you mark your lid. Yes. After right. you that proving it up. Now it leaks, and no matter what I did, it leaked. So I bought a 10 gallon one, and no matter what I do, it don't leak. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other thing that you can deal with that, Harry, is like like what I have now. So when I was when I was doing this, I uh, was casting in, out of my garage, and I would I didn't have a big air compressor. So I would fill it up, valve it off, and it'd leak off. But usually, typically, it was probably past the working time. So, I, but then, like when I start turning, it, I'd see voids in it. Yeah. And um, so now, what I do, I've got a, I've got an 80 gallon compressor, and I leave it connected. I don't, I don't disconnect it, and I don't valve it off. I leave. It, so, but so, it, with an 80 gallon compressor, you are at 125 psi. I, no, it's I, got a pop off valve without regulator. On, on this, this pot has a regulator. My other one, when I rebuilt it, one of the things that they said about the regulator on the Harbor Freight paint pot was no good, so I've got an external regulator for it. Okay. And I just plug it in line right. and adjust this to 50 pounds, and it, it holds it 50 holds pounds. Holds it 50 pounds, yeah. And yeah, it, it will yeah. stay. Yeah, that's and so when you get ready to hold these, like this this one, you're going to take one side off, and then you're going to pry this blank out. Yeah. And so. Starts like this. This is a block of wood that I said that I would pass around with this, and you can't see any of the red streaks or anything in this in this block of wood. But whenever it turned out like this, and then uh, so this this piece here, I've sanded it down to 12,000 with the uh, the Sea Soft, 
The Sea Soft is a wet or dry product. You can use it with a foam backed. And that's what we what we bought for the club that's back here on the table. It's a, it's a latex paper with the fine grit on it up to 1200. So what I did was made me some strips to do your, and I think Buddy Chesser was the first one to talk about this as a demo. When you're doing acrylics, you have to use water to cool the, well, that wet stuff, it works just as well. Well, is, it, or is that what you're talking about? No, the diatomaceous earth, the diatomaceous and earth. wax and mineral oil. Well, you have to sand it first you got to, to, get it, well, to get it down. So so this this has been sanded down to 1,200, and then, um, Grayson, here's your piece. I'm going to pass it around. I want this one back. Because I'll make another one. But y'all can take a look at that and see the kind of mountainous range on there. I've got some, I was going to try to turn one that I bought at SWAT. This was $16 for this plank. But it's a piece of maple that's been cast here on this, uh, and it was $16. So that's, that's what I've got right here that I've cast this piece of maple maple burl with with the, the violet resin and it, it will be translucent even though what you see here yeah, on there is, there is, is dark and that that red that's passing around was a darker color until I got it turned down now you can see the the mountainous regions of the burl in there which which makes a cool effect and I don't think that I'm going to get get time to turn on here but uh, I found this this at Hobby Lobby it's a silicon mat it's over in the cookie sheet aisle and it just fits my lathe and for what I'm doing now what I was doing yesterday and I had the tailstock up I did it up like this but uh, it protects the bed of my lathe from the epoxies and from water and when you're doing your sanding with water, you definitely want to protect the bed of your lathe. It'll, it'll rust faster than... I cut up a yoga mat. You know, they had it on clearance, and I go, I can cut that sucker up any size I want to. I, uh, I've got one of those. I hadn't thought about using it. <laughs> to me, it's it, a good idea. This, this is four ninety nine at, at Hobby Lobby. for the whole thing. And it's it's 11 inches by 16 inches. And that'll, there's nothing going to stick to that. No, except, except super glue. I, I well, even the super glue will peel off. It won't mind. It won't. Well, I mean, it's, that's what it's for, so I don't care. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not using it for anything else. And, and for using the UV resin on the lathe, you can put the mat in. That. Barry Gross was just using a. He was using a towel. This, this is a little more better than a towel. This is not going to seep through this. Yeah, and, and it's you know you thin. for for doing CA finish, and I'm doing that, and then so I'm sanding it wet with the acrylics, and this is the uh, the Zona uh, polishing paper, 3M polishing paper, and I've cut strips that are about three quarters of an inch or one inch. I keep them in in the water. And then I pulled them out based on the color, and um, you can go from uh, coarse to fine in there. Starts out at 400. That's not really, not what I would consider coarse, but 400, 600, 1200. Uh, I think 3,000, 6,000, 8,000 is kind of the, the grits there in that range of the zone of paper. May I ask a question? Sure. Uh, uh, that compared to the pads, what, the, what are they called? A Abernet or no? No, no not Abernet. Micromatch. Micromatch. Which one do you prefer? The Zona paper. The Zona paper. I tried. I tried the Zona paper, and I didn't care for it. Maybe I was doing something wrong. You you can get a lot more of this Zona paper than you can the micro mesh, and the micro mesh is expensive. Yeah, but it lasts a long time. I I didn't find that. So and. and uh, Barry, I think it's Barry Gross. I don't know if it's him or uh, Jason was speaking. He was talking about using Aberlon, and it, they've got a 
they're, they've got half as many pads, one on one side, one on the other side of grids. Right. And the Abrilon is the same thing as microwave, right. essentially. Right. It's just a different, somebody else made the, the product. And uh, so when I get, get ready to finish my re, uh, resin cast, piece the the bottle stopper that's going around what I did was I went through the stages of grit of uh, from 240 to I think I did 800 I don't think I had I didn't have any of the 1200 so I went and grabbed the sheet off of our stuff oh the club a little bit of money but uh, the, these foam back pads worked real good for for the pre-send into that, it wasn't it wasn't a real aggressive, and what you're trying to do with with the resin, you're trying to polish it and take those scratches down real where you can't see them with the naked eye. And um, I know Scott Goins done a lot of stuff with, and it's it's different when you're working on stuff where you got wood and you fill the wormhole and you're trying to do and like that piece right there. So I would you. You want to kind of blend the wood and the the resin, so it's. But you want to make sure that the resin doesn't have scratch marks in it. And so, uh, I liked what the CSOF was doing. Uh, that CSOF paper, like what we have, I liked it. And then um, on my CA finish, I, that's where I used the zone of paper and the uh, the fine polishing pad. Now, I put three coats of this craft coat that's on the classic nib. He, uh, he had it last year at Arizona Silhouette, or he, I guess it was it classic nib last year? I bought some in there this year. Well, I, I bought another bottle of it, and what I, I had started to use, Jim Bob posted a, a video about using this craft coat, and so for me, and it's, it's, I've noticed here recently, and I don't know if it's a COVID thing for me after I've had COVID with the, the VOCs, and the, with the resins, with the finishes, mm -hmm. they really bother me, and it, it triggers migraines, and then, I mean, here back in the winter time, I was thrown up for 36 hours straight, and so it's it's something that I'm really sensitive. To. I have to be uh, cognizant of, and this this says low VOCs, and so I can finish something on a lathe, and the odor's not going to get to me. Even the CA glue sometimes gets to me. Is that a polish or is that a finish? Yeah. Finish. Answer his question. Was that the clear coat? Is it a polish or is it a finish? It's a finish. It's a finish. Th this is a finish. Okay. And so what this, what I've done is I've sanded that bottle stopper down, and I put several coats of this. Um, since I was doing it yesterday, finishing yesterday, I only got three coats on. Normally I'd go three to five. And then uh, I actually took that and pulled out the bell buff system and buffed it down with the, the three stages of buff. on the, And that's why it's really shiny but uh, what you want to use when you do your resins is is something that's going to buff it out and and do that and and what i had originally done when i started doing pins was i'd get to about 600 grit 800 grit i started using the the 3m paper it's the polishing paper that's a little finer it gets up to uh, four and five thousand wet sand and then I think Jim Bob turned me on to the zone of paper, 3M polishing paper, which does a little bit. What I would do is I'd get it to about 2,000 grit or so, and then I would use uh, Meguiar's polishing wax. And that would kind of take the last little bit out of it. But what I've noticed when I use the, the, poly, the Nova paper or the Zona, the Zona paper or the... Uh, 3M polishing papers, you don't get those scratches when you use that. And I, I don't even use the, the plastic polish anymore. And, and I, I do lots of CA finishes on there. Uh, the finish on this pen that I, both of these pens that I passed around, those are, those are with that Zona polishing paper. 
things that I have cast, wasp nest, yellow jacket nest. So this this one's cut, ready to go, and and it's going to look a lot like the honeycomb of the the. Uh, do you stabilize those first? No. They say to, but I mean, what, how are you going to stabilize this? Okay, hey, well, you stabilize anything paper. else. It's, there's just not much, not much material to it. Doesn't matter. Uh, now, now, what they do say on the cactus, so this is a cactus skeleton, is to stabilize it first. And, but it is. Is that prickly pear? It's prickly pear. And this, this is the skeleton inside the prickly pear that kind of dried out. Mean. And I think I have some of that running around. <laughs> I've, I've got... I've got a... Uh, a Purina feed sack full of it at my house. And Steve Sperry was supposed to come and borrow some off of it from me. Bump some of it off of there. But... He never has done so. This this is a common thing that's cast as a cactus, Choya cactus. And I got I got this from Scott Cho, and I had I hadn't been casting, so I hadn't got used yet. Scott, so this, when uh, my aunt gave me her casting stuff, she had bought some bog cypress, either out of Louisiana or Florida. I remember what she said. But this is this is some cypress that they found in the in the swamp, pulled it out of the swamp. And it's uh, so it's year, years years old, and I, I've got a an order full of that. And that's like a, okay, that stuff they sell at uh, Pantex, and it's called Pecky Cypress. Pecky Cypress. It's horrible <laughs> stuff <laughs> for woodworking. Why do they carry it? Because a lot of people like. Cabinet doors and cabinet frames built out of it. Um, yeah. But something else that we've got. I, Scott Gowen made a bowl here recently when he did his layered bowls out of uh, the. Yeah, I'm not going to get to my turn. <coughs> okay. Not, yeah. So I, I already I looked and I had 20 minutes. I didn't figure I could get it done in that. But. Uh, We'll we'll talk we'll talk more about the casting and so Dick Dick Markham had a piece of chestnut that was wormy and uh, Scott going well what do you do with this and that's one of the pieces that he did out of his his layered bowl where he did that in one of his demos back back in the spring and that was I've got another piece of that that's about like this and. and this was kind of what I had in mind for it, a piece of chestnut that's just, I mean, it is just eaten up that came from, from Dick Markham. But uh, are there any questions? We've kind of been interactive throughout the demo, and like I said, I'm not going to get to my turning. I was going to, I was going to try to turn the bottle stopper, but I noticed that it was just going to be more about this stuff than, than the turning. Uh, so that's almost like a dragon egg, isn't it? You hadn't talked about the cost of the various resins. Uh, hi. So the cheapest one on the table is this, but when you talk about the volume, this, this was twenty nine ninety nine at Hobby Lobby, and they don't do their forty percent off anymore, so you can't do that. Came cheap. This was one hundred and one dollars at SWAT from Turntex. The the liquid diamonds in the JB Royal is about a hundred bucks for, and you're gonna get that's probably a gallon and a half there. This is a this is a gallon kit of liquid diamonds. Uh, I bought two. They bought the tabletop stuff, and it cost me a hundred and a half. And I thought, my yeah, it, and you can't afford to do this very much, particularly when you. When the way it starts leaking at the bottom, it makes you say, "Oh my goodness, what happened?" Here? It well, in a year and a half, it's gone up quite considerably. It's so popular. It's it's a petroleum base. Uh, the cherry tree that my dad was getting was produced in California, and because of their 
their uh, political mindset against petroleum-based products. They don't make it in California anymore. The, they went out of business, sold it to, sold the recipe to Minnesota. And so he's getting it direct from the manufacturer in Minnesota now. The JB Royal was Royal Palm. <laughs> and uh, if you get into the casting communities, it's the same recipe <laughs> as the Palm Royal. And they they kept part of the name because they like they. It it was a a mutual friendly agreement there. That the recipe stayed the same, so that that epoxy. But it it is a it's an acetate. It's a petroleum based product, so. When we have administration that is negatively towards yeah. petroleum-based products, it's going to go up, and that's yeah. that's what I've noticed over the past year and a half is how that that stuff is really shot up. Uh, my pin tubes, if I was going to paint them, the guys paint those with uh, enamel, white enamel. They make make rack paint them with the enamel. Uh, I've got I've got a kit that's uh, model paint from Hobby Lobby that I paint mine with. It's various colors. Does uh, it hold up better than sunbleach. spray paint? I don't know. I don't. I don't know. It probably uh, looks smoother than spray paint. And I haven't. I, this had never been open, so this this shows how little I've done. But I'm I'm getting my shop pretty well settled to where I can do stuff. And uh, like I said, if anybody wants to come out to my shop and work on some things, whether whether it's turning or casting stuff, you're welcome. Ben. Guys, I use Amazing Clear from Hobby Hobby without a pressure pot with pretty good results. I don't have much trouble with it. You can buy it by the gallon, and it's about eighty two or three dollars a gallon. I, I do a lot of both <laughs> stuff in pressure pot and like this there's no way I can put it in a pressure pot this you know that and that was on a eight foot board right did and I how are you get the bubbles out of that heat gun heat gun, heat gun. Or or torch. Torch. You, yeah. you can use a, a paint gun that produce the heat and it'll bring the, the bubbles to the surface or a torch like he said a torch don't get it too hot <laughs> yeah David? Whenever you uh, hook your vacuum pump up to something to let it soak into there, how long does that get to take? Do you know saying. when to release the vacuum when all the air quits coming out of it? When it quits bubbling. Okay. That's, that's a Jim Bob question. Because I, I hadn't done any stabilizing, and I've always farmed my stuff over to Jim Bob. Oh, He's, yeah, he got idea. the stabilizing chamber, it's what, last year? No, I've had it for about three years. Three now. years now, and so he he's done all my stabilizing. But the uh, the one that we came back with from the club is going to stay at my house, and uh, I I will advertise when I'm getting ready to stabilize, or if somebody needs some stabilizer, you contact me or contact Jim Bob. He can contact me, and and I will I will get into that. But like I said, it's. It's kind of a first step process for some of this stuff that needs to be stabilized before you put resin in it. it the resin is not going to bleed down into the wood. It's just filling in the voids. Price, did you buy enough cactus juice as far as to buy it off of you when you do start stabilizing? I've got four gallons. I can. I hadn't bought, I hadn't bought any yet. I've got four gallons on hand. And so Jim Bob's on the south side of town. I'm on the north side of town, almost almost directly north and south, <clears> Milwaukee <throat> and Frankfurt. So, uh, and my my chamber is only a six inch diameter uh, for stabilizing. I've got a big vacuum pot. If anybody thinks it, it's I don't know, maybe ten or twelve inches in diameter and about fourteen inches long. I so, got two five gallon ones. This, this week in preparation for this demonstration, one of the things that one of the guys talked about taking the bubbles out of your epoxy mist is put it in a degassing chamber. So 
basically what that is, is is our stabilizing chamber without any liquid in it. And you drop it down there, pull a vacuum on it, and it pulls the air out of the, the liquid. And it, it will foam up, and when it quits foaming, the gas is out of it. You can see it is clear top. Yeah, and it, it is, it's a ton clearer than what you, when you mix that up, you're going to see. Uh, I hadn't done any of this, but I've been watching a fellow on YouTube named Jim Sprague. He has Sprague woodworking in Canada, and he does this every day, all day long, on boats. He's a professional boat owner, just like I can do this. And everything you're talking about here, he goes into. He, he, it's really, if you're into this, you need to watch that on YouTube. Right. He's a turner turner, and he's professionally turning bows, you know, by putting burls and stuff together and making bows. And, uh, it, everything you're talking about, I, I'm interested in. I don't have a option to go do it anymore. I don't have a strength to time either way. But, I think there's a lot of information that you will get watching that Sprague's woodworking on YouTube is just really cool. And he talks about all this stuff that you talk about. He uses a product called uh, Designer Epoxy Deep Cast, and it's made in Canada. But you can order it right now. It's on sale during Labor Day weekend. And then you can use his passcode, uh, Jim, with turning in my gym, in my gym, yeah. and get 10 more 10 percent off one time. I, I bought six gallons of it. <laughs> one, one of the things, so so basically, I'm doing a summary up here and kind of giving in information about it. One of the things to me that I noticed on my chart here when I printed it out from Don Ward was uh, and he uses the Silmar 41, which is a different epoxy from a different vendor. and uh, one of the things that I was talking about a while ago was the hardness. It's the only one on here that's half the hardness of the rest of it. For us, for our turning and our turning tools, uh, I don't use these very often, but if you're going to do resin, you're going to be using your carbide tools. I, tr I, try, to, I try to, well, I hadn't spent the money on them. So, uh, most of my turning tools are, are the better high-speed steel, and that's one of the things to me was to learn the technique. When I learned a better technique by teaching our classes at the Garden Arts Center, I've learned through the years how to sharpen my tools and keep a really good edge on it. And I can turn things that have resin on them, like this, this oak burl here. Uh, and, I, and I did a piece that was an oak burl that I did one of our one of our magazine shows in it, Ray Key, is on the front page of that, and it's a burl. And so what I was trying to do was duplicate that or emulate that piece, and uh, I had to use carbide tools there on it. And, and for when, and what I'm trying to get into now is ho more hollowing, and to do hollowing, most of those tools are carbides. So, any other questions? Okay, now one thing I noticed on Bri when Bryce passed around his his uh, chart is uh, some of these things have a shelf life, you know, like twelve months is the maximum here of shelf life. So you know, I think it would be. Behoove our group to go together and do group buy.